Take your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Galatians chapter 5. Paul the Apostle wrote these words, If we live in the Spirit, let us walk in the Holy Spirit. Here in chapter 5 of the book of Galatians, Paul is instructing the believers in the work of the Holy Spirit. Beginning in chapter 5, verse 5, he underscores how we might know we have been filled with the Holy Spirit. He underscores, first of all, that we will live by the Holy Spirit. We've just turned the page of chapter 4 of the book of Galatians, where Paul explained how Abraham and Sarah had been given a promise, a promise of a son. But then Sarah went to Abraham and Paul would write it like this in the New Living Translation. They would have Hagar, the maid servant of Sarah, become the mother of that promised child. And of course, it wasn't the promised child at all. Abraham and Hagar, Paul would write, was produced by human effort. And now Paul writes in chapter 4 of the book of Galatians that Ishmael represents the law, or that is, he wrote, by human effort. But Isaac becomes the child of the promise, and that is the work of the Holy Spirit. One of the first character qualities that Paul writes about, you will know that you have been filled with the Holy Spirit when your life has been changed and transformed and you begin to live by the Holy Spirit. He continues here in verse 16 by underscoring that you will be guided by the Holy Spirit. And then he explains in verse 17 that as you are living and being directed by the Holy Spirit, that the very desires that you have will begin to shift. They'll begin to change. And the things you used to do, you may not like doing them anymore. And the things that you've never done before, like reading the Bible, like praying, going to church, or hanging out in fellowship with other believers, that God will give to you by his Holy Spirit new desires. And in verse number 18, Paul wrote, you will now be directed every day, every hour, every month, every year. You will be guided and you will be directed by the Holy Spirit. And as you begin to change, as a new believer begins to grow in the things of God, their life will begin to blossom and they'll, they'll, they'll be a, 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 a fragrance. They, they will literally change. Paul writes it like this in verse number 22. You will grow new fruit in your life. And the fruit is being produced by the Holy Spirit doing a work inside of you. And number six, Paul writes in verse 25, you will discover that you're no longer walking in the flesh, the carnal nature. You're no longer walking after the things of, of the world. But now you're focused on the things of God. And because you've been filled with the Holy Spirit and you begin to be transformed, you will be living, you'll be guided, you'll have new desires, you'll be directed, you'll have fruit, and you will now begin to walk. And it'll begin as baby steps. But soon those baby steps will become mature and you will find yourself walking in the Holy Spirit. As Paul is teaching on the work of the Holy Spirit, he introduces throughout his writings spiritual warfare. He writes about conflict and battles that we have in this world. 
those that are historians and study things like World War II, they recognize that the reason that the war would be given the title World War II is because the big war wasn't against one country with conflict, one known enemy. No, there were several. Predominant would be the Germans, specifically Nazis. And then coming forth that made this war called World War II, the big war, is because it wasn't just with Germany, but it was with Mussolini down in Italy. And of course, you recall the history of Pearl Harbor and how Japan would draw America into the war by an act of conflict. You see, World War III was both in Pacific and it was in the Atlantic. It was, it was up north down in Germany. It was down south in Italy. It was literally three wars in one. And I think sometimes when we come to the book of Galatians, we, we come without the understanding, without the training, without the depth of roots in the word of God to recognize that there are three battlefields that you face. And Paul writes about them and he instructs about them. There is the battle that we have in this world. And the author, the apostle John, in 1 John writes about the things of this world and, and how the appetite for the things and the pressure and, and how, to, how we struggle trying not to conform and, and make decisions that are worldly decisions, John would write. Jesus spoke about it. But there's a second battle and it's not just the things of this world that are filled with ambition and filled with greed and property and materialism and just the pressures of this world. But Paul would also write what some refer to as spiritual warfare in the book of Ephesians chapter 6. And Ephesians chapter 6 is the handbook of spiritual warfare where Paul wrote, here, read this and put on the full armor of God so that you can battle the devil. That you can stand firm against the schemes of the devil. So now we realize in the Bible as we study that spiritual warfare includes the challenges and the conflicts of the pressure of this world and the enemy, Satan, the devil, his fallen angels called demons. There is the battle Paul writes about of the demonic, of the satanic. Put on the full armor of God. Put on your helmet of salvation, your chest plate of righteousness, the belt buckle of truth, the shield of faith, the sword of the Lord, and shod your feet in peace. Put on the full armor of God to stand against the schemes of the devil. But remember, we're studying Galatians chapter 5. And what Paul is writing about in spiritual warfare here in chapter 5 is not focused on the battle in the world or the battle with the demonic. No, he's dealing with the battle of the flesh. If you allow the Holy Spirit to guide your life, Paul wrote in Galatians chapter 5, verse 16, you won't be doing what the carnal nature, that sinful nature, that, that old nature, that old man desires. We're blessed to have so many translations of the Bible. But sometimes it can become a burden. Because we can become confused with all of these different words. 
what Paul is writing about is the word flesh. In Greek, it's carnal. In fact, carnal is the word often used in the King James Version. And carnal is the expression from the Greek about the flesh. In the New International Version, the phrase is translated the old self. King James may use the phrase the old man. New Living Translation likes to translate it the sinful nature or the old nature. For simplicity in teaching, let me just say this. We'll stick with one word, the flesh. There are three battles that you will face. You will face the battle of the world. You'll face the battle of the devil. And you'll face the battle of your flesh. And John the Apostle writes about the battle of the world. And Paul writes about the battle of the demonic and Satan himself in Ephesians chapter 6. But here in Galatians chapter 5, the focus is actually about the battle within, about the battle of the flesh, that old nature, that old man. Paul wrote, remember the flesh has a desire to do evil. Remember the flesh desires are exactly opposite of the desires in your life that the Holy Spirit puts within you. We already know in Galatians chapter 5, verse 17, that when you became born again, the Spirit of God dwells within you, and the Spirit of God gives to you brand new desires. But within your soul, there is that flesh. and There is a battle within that is fighting what the Holy Spirit is birthing in your heart. And the flesh desires exactly the opposite of what the Holy Spirit desires. And there's a battle that happens inside of us. It's a fight. It's a conflict. It's a war. And it's constant. It doesn't come to an end. Every day my spirit wakes up and I feed my spirit. And every day my flesh wakes up and my flesh deny, de desires to be fed. Paul wrote it, remember the spirit gives us desires that are opposite of the flesh, and the flesh gives us desires that are opposite of the spirit. These two forces, that is the flesh, and again the carnal nature, the sinful nature, the old man, the old nature, the flesh is constantly fighting the Holy Spirit in our lives. In your Bible, circle the word constant. World War I has been over for a long time. World War II, they signed the treaty and it came to an end. There is a battle on earth that has to do with the carnal nature. It has to do with the flesh. And the Bible says that that battle is constant. We face it. Every day, Paul would write to the church in Corinth and he would say to these that were struggling and being defeated by their flesh, he actually wrote these words in chapter 3 of 1 Corinthians, I could not speak to you as spiritual, but I had to speak to you as carnal Christians. Carnal Christians almost sounds like an oxymoron. It, it shouldn't coexist. I thought if you're a Christian, you've overcome the flesh. But remember, Paul wrote in Galatians chapter 5, it's a constant battle. And in 1 Corinthians 3, he says, these folks were losing the battle. And they were operating in their flesh and their sinful nature. Ten years ago, I felt led by God's spirit, guided by God's spirit to retire my motorcycle. It's a passion I've always had, and it was a sport that I dearly loved. And it was not an easy decision to stop writing. But as the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, you need to let that go, you need to let that go, I kept arguing with God. Until finally one day I heard the Spirit of God say to my heart, Bill, if you want the bike, keep the motorcycle but I'll never ride with you again. I'll never be there with my angels. I'll never protect you again. 
I go, whoa, 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 wait a minute, Lord. I want the bike, but I don't want the bike without your blessing. I'm speaking to you about carnal Christianity. I'm speaking about the reality of life and how difficult it is to let things go. I sold that motorcycle in just a matter of hours for the asking price, paid in full, paid in cash. I couldn't believe it happened so quickly. I traded in my motorcycle boots for walking shoes. And for the past 10 years, I've adopted a whole healthy lifestyle I would have never imagined. Every morning I rise and walk and pray for two hours every day. It turns out to be about five miles. It's not a fast pace. It's a prayer walk. And prayer is the most important part. But I found as I began to walk, I wanted to hike, and I found myself in the high Sierra. And for the last 10 years, I take off on my day off, which is a Monday, and I head to the mountains. And I look for a peak, and I climb a peak. Good exercise, and it's healthy. Moses climbed Mount Sinai. Abraham climbed Mount Moriah. I enjoy the high Sierra and climbing the peaks. But I notice things begin to change. And one of the things that I've always just had a weakness for is an apple fritter or maybe a hot cinnamon roll. I've always enjoyed donuts. My sons used to make fun of me when they were young because I knew where every donut shop was in the greater region of our city and county. One day my son called me and he said, Dad, I have a problem. And I met with him and he was crying. He said, Dad, I know how you love donuts, but a chocolate donut won't solve my problem. My reputation in the family for the love of the donut was somewhat famous. But as you grow in the things of Christ, you let some things go. One of the reasons why people have a hard time breaking a bad habit is because their attempt is to stop doing something which is extremely difficult. And to be honest with you, in my humble opinion, it doesn't really work. But I'll tell you the key to ending a bad habit is start a new habit. It's not stop doing the old things, it's rather start doing the new things. Start walking in the Spirit. Start listening to the Holy Spirit. Start saying yes to God. He is speaking to you. He is guiding you. He is directing you. He wants you to walk in his Holy Spirit. And the more you walk, the more you listen, the more he speaks, and the more he guides. Paul will list out the fruit of the flesh, and he'll write about hostility and anger. He'll write about discord, division, quarreling. He'll list out six qualities of fruit in the life of the carnal Christian that's walking in the flesh. And they will include envy and division and discord and decision, dissension and self-ambition, anger, jealousy, quarreling, hostility. Lust, impurity, and even sexual immorality. And people will cloak things and they'll say, the spouse and them are having problems. And they'll tell me that they met somebody else and they really are so deceived in their flesh, they'll actually say to me that this other person, they're a Christian too. And they're having marital problems and they'll start this 
immoral relationship as a Christian prayer meeting. And obviously, God was not in that. But so it is with the work of the flesh. It's human effort. It's Sarah and Abraham communicating and discussing and bringing Hagar into it until finally they birthed this child called Ishmael. And it was not God's plan. It was not God's promise. It was not God's design. It was human effort. There are six fruits of the flesh that Paul lists in detail. You'll find them in Galatians chapter 5. Remember, the flesh desires are opposite that of the Holy Spirit. You know, Paul writes about that God has called us to, to live the life of Christ. But what is the life of Christ? That's what he's called you to do, to live the life of Christ. And he gave us the guidance and the key in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, when he wrote, My flesh has been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but it's Christ that dwells or lives in me. So I live in this earthly body by trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I have been crucified. I have crucified the sinful nature. And now Christ dwells within me. He explained it in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. If anyone is in Christ, he has become a new creation. The old nature, the flesh, is crucified. And behold, you've become a brand new being. You've been born again, a new creation. The old things have passed, and behold, all things have become new. Paul explained it in Romans chapter 12. Don't copy the behavior of the world, but let God transform you. Let God change you in the new person he designed you to become by changing even the way you think. He's writing about the fruit of the Spirit, and that's the key. Ten years ago when I sold my motorcycle and I began my morning prayer walk, the first scripture God gave me to pray every day is Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. The way it flows from my heart is the word joy. I call it happiness, but I'm thinking of it as a Christian as joy. So as I begin my prayer walk at 5 a.m. this morning, I ask myself as I walk up the street, Bill, do you want to be happy today? Do you want to have the joy of the Lord in your life today? You need to be kind. You need to be gentle. You need to walk in goodness and faithfulness. You need to walk in peace wherever you're at. It's going to require you, Bill, to have self-control. And you won't see the big picture today, so you're going to need patience. And Bill, whatever you do, if you cannot do it in love, I question why you're doing it at all. You see, I take Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, and now for 10 years, 365 days a year, I pray the fruit of the Spirit in my life. I crucify the flesh. I die daily. I recognize the fruit of the flesh, and I say, Almighty God, let the fruit of your Spirit flow through my life. Paul wrote, those who belong to Christ have nailed the passions and desires of the sinful nature to the cross, and now we walk and live by the power of the Holy Spirit. He has called you to be filled and to continue to be filled and to overcome that constant battle in the power of the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, being filled and overflowing with God's Holy Spirit. I live today in the Spirit and I walk in the Holy Spirit 
in Jesus' name.